Morning. Mark chapter 9. If you got a Bible, Mark 9. That's a cross on the screen behind me. It's a necklace. And probably today, that's kind of what we think of when we think of cross. I don't know about you. That's kind of what I think of. I think about a symbol like is on the screen. It's a symbol that we enjoy. Uh, we wear it as a cross around our neck. We wear it on our clothes. I was in Miss Joe's office earlier this morning. She's got a cross on the wall that says blessed. Don't you? I think I saw that. I got crosses in my office. We got crosses everywhere. And so we, we know the cross. We like the cross. We display the cross. We wear the cross. We honor the cross. We thank God for the cross. But it hasn't always been that way with the cross. The cross for a long time was a real problem. And so we are in this, we're kind of getting near the end of this series. I've been talking about uh, the big picture, the long story of the Bible and condensing it down into the, the major points where things really change, uh, the, the points of Scripture that inform the rest of the Bible. That's what we've been talking about. And today we come to the cross. And the cross is a difficult subject for me because it's something that we're all aware of. Um, it's something that we, we all know what it is. We know what we're talking about. So we're not talking about anybody else's death. We're talking about the death of Jesus. And so, of course, we display it, we wear it, we love it, we honor it, we talk about it, we thank God for it. But the cross, for a really, really long time, was a really, really big problem. Um, for instance, if you got your Bible in Mark chapter 9, I think you'll see some of this. The cross would eventually become the central theme of the New Testament. It would be what a lot of the New Testament writers um, talk about and highlight and explain in different ways, a lot of atonement theories. Um, it would be a, become a, a huge, major focus of Christianity in the early days. The death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus in Paul's words, 1 Corinthians 15, happened according to the Scriptures. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of what Old Testament was pointing to. It's what New Testament writers seem to point back to. But at the same time, it was totally unexpected. I don't know that anybody that was following Jesus around really expected the cross to happen in the way that it happened. Their expectation was more about what we've been talking about about a Messiah king that comes and overthrows the Romans, um, a king who comes and renews Israel and restores purity to God's people. That's what they thought was going to happen. It's what they expected to happen. But what they got was Jesus, who was born in the backwoods in the sticks. Um, what they got was Jesus, who comes and preaches a message totally different than what they all thought he was going to preach. What they got was Jesus, who comes and starts talking about going to his cross, going to his death. And he talks about several times, you know, I'm going to go and, and be delivered up to the powers and going to be killed and three days later going to rise. And sometimes they would say things like, far be it from you, Lord, that's not going to happen. That's not the Messiah that we know. It's not the Christ that we're looking for. That's not anything like what we expected. But one of those places in Mark chapter 9, verses 30 to 32, Jesus talks about, I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to be killed. And, you know, that's how things are going to end for me on earth, basically is what Jesus is saying. And at the end of that, Mark 9, 30 to 32, you read these interesting words. Son of man's going to be delivered into the hands of men. They'll kill him. When he's killed, after three days, he'll rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. We're almost to the end of Mark in this particular section. Well, we're over halfway, right? Jesus has, has been teaching for a while now. He's been instructing folks about what's going to happen. He's been talking to them about his mission and then he starts talking about the cross, and this is not the first time, but they don't understand. And not only do they not understand, they're afraid to ask at this point. I don't know what's going on, and at this point, I'm afraid to ask what's happening with the cross. Even after the cross and after the resurrection, they didn't know it yet, but in Luke 24, Jesus meets some folks on the way to Emmaus, on the road to Emmaus, and they're talking. And one of the things they say in Luke 24 is, you know, we had hoped that he was going to be the one who would come and restore everything we wanted and redeem us and bring salvation and healing to the world. We had hoped that he was going to do that, but you know, he died. He went to the cross and he died. And this was a major, major stumbling block in early Christianity. Even the New Testament writers dealt with it and the folks who wrote um, Christian stuff in the early days after the New Testament, they dealt with it. It was a huge stumbling block for a lot of people in the world. The cross was not always a symbol that we wear and display and talk about and thank God for. It was a really big problem. And so maybe we need a little bit of a deeper understanding about it. 
Would you flip back a chapter if you're in Mark chapter 9 and go back to chapter 8? Because what we, I think, have to understand about this idea is that the cross is not just a death. And it's not just a symbol. It's not just something that we thank God for and then leave it at that. The idea of a sacrificial death was woven deeply into Jesus' understanding of what his role was going to be. The idea of a sacrificial death was always coming in his mind. And so as early as Mark chapter 8, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. We've already looked at Mark chapter 9. Same thing happens again in Mark chapter 10, verse uh, 33. He says, we're going to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes and they'll condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. They'll mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him and after three days he will rise. Now nobody, nobody really thought it. Even when he said those things, nobody really understood it. Their, their lack of understanding is pretty surprising, I think. Their shock and amazement when it really happens, they desert him. Nobody really thought that this was what was going to happen. Jesus told an entire parable in Mark chapter 12 about a man, uh, verse 1, who plants a vineyard and puts a fence around it and digs a pit for the wine press and builds a tower and leases it to the tenants and goes into another country. That's verse 1. And when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of that vineyard. And they took him. And they beat him, and they sent him away empty-handed. And he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed. And so with many others, and some they beat, and some they killed. And he had still one other, a beloved son. You know where this is going. Jesus is talking about the vineyard is Israel, and he said, look, the Father has, has sent folks to y'all a lot, and we've always killed them. We've always struck them with violence. We beat them. We ran them out. We didn't listen to them, never listened to the prophets. And he had one more guy, one more shot, and he sends his beloved son. And he said, they'll respect my son, but those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? Well, he'll come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And then, I like verse 12, they're trying to arrest him, but they fear the people because they perceive that he told the parable against them. You think? Of course he did. They had rejected him over and over and over again. And what they were rejecting, really, was the idea that his kingdom was different. It's not like this world. It's not like what they've always thought. It's not anything like what they expected. And whenever they finally see it, and they can finally seize it, they start to understand that things are totally different now. And they don't like it. And so Jesus says, They're going to kill me because of this. In Mark 10, verse 45, this idea that Jesus has come to give his life as a ransom for many is part of his mission as a Messiah, a ransom to redeem and release, a ransom to death, to release them from death, and he had to die in in order to do that. And then whenever he's getting really close to that time over in Mark chapter 14, as he is in the middle of Passover season, and for the Jews, ancient Jews, incredibly important holiday where they remember the ransom that was paid for them, and they remember the redemption and restoration that God secured for them through the Exodus. That's what the Passover meal is all about. And right in the middle of in Mark chapter 14, verses 22 um, through 25, sometimes we use this as part of our Lord's Supper, the Exodus was always remembered with bread and wine and a lamb. Those were the prescribed ingredients along with with several others. Jesus takes at least the bread and the wine, and as they were eating, verse 22, he takes the bread, and after blessing it, he breaks it and gives it to them and says, take, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it, and he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many. And truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so in the middle of Passover season, Jesus takes the bread and he says, now this is no longer what you've always thought. This is about me now. I'm the new Passover lamb. And he takes the blood and he says, this is no longer what you thought it was. This is my blood being poured out for you. I'm the Passover lamb. There's no lamb on the table because the lamb is at the table. And so now it's all about Jesus giving his life as a ransom to free the captives 
Much like happened in the Exodus, and the true Lamb of God is sacrificed. That's the cross. It's a sacrificial death. But even that, even recognizing the cross is more than just a death. Recognizing it as a sacrificial death is still not enough. Missing on this slide is the idea that this particular sacrificial death was a choice. It was not that they took it from him. It was that Jesus willingly engaged in this for redemptive suffering. Let me tell you what I mean by that. We've read in Mark already that the Son of Man must suffer. We knew the suffering was coming. A sacrificial death was on its way. What we haven't read, Gospel of Mark, are the verses on the screen in John chapter 10. This is the Good Shepherd passage. This is where Jesus talks about the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full or have it more abundantly. Three times in John 10, Jesus talks about how he will choose to lay down his life. They're not going to take it from me. It's going to be a choice that Jesus makes. I'm, I'm so glad, Chuck, wherever you are, you talked about Isaiah 53 just a few minutes ago because that saves me a couple of minutes in this sermon. But I do want to call your attention to a couple of verses here. Isaiah chapter 53, starting at verse 4. Originally, Isaiah 53 was about Israel. It was about the people of God. Um, Jesus takes it and appropriates it to himself, and then it becomes kind of this theme in New Testament of appropriated to the sacrifice of Jesus. But the idea is that this choice of redemptive suffering, not retribution, not a punishment, not anything like that. Um, it's, it's redemption. It's Jesus choosing to suffer to bring healing and redemption in some kind of way. We'll flesh it out in a few minutes. But it's a choice, and it seems to originate from these ideas in Isaiah 53, like verse 4. Surely he has borne our griefs and has carried our sorrows. And we, people, esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We look at him, and that's how we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. Like Chuck said, not not his, ours. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. You know what I like about the word healed is that most of the time healing doesn't happen immediately. If there's a sickness, especially a serious sickness, Sickness, it takes time for that to bring healed, to be cured. And so the same is true. I like the word healed because we're all in this process of being healed. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so pretty clearly, I think, in Isaiah chapter 53, this this loss and this pain, this redemptive suffering is the vehicle for healing. The idea behind the cross was not just that Jesus was going to die. It's not just that he was going to suffer for us or anything like that. It was that he was going to suffer and die to bring healing and redemption and salvation into the world. And so that's Jesus, and that's how Jesus uses Isaiah chapter 53. New Testament writers picked up on this. Paul uh, most commonly is the one who does it. We'll get to 2 Corinthians 5 in a second, but in Romans 5, 8. It's Paul talking about how God has shown his great love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for the ungodly. Enemies of God, Paul says, and Christ died for us. He chose to give himself up, to give his life for us. He laid down his life to show what love is. Paul does a very similar thing in Romans 8, 31 and 32, where he talks about how God gave us Jesus for all of us. Not some of us, not a few of us, but God gave Jesus for all of us. But what does that really mean? Well, those are the Romans passages. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, Paul starts talking about this reconciliation idea. And the idea that, is, uh, that Paul has is that in Christ, and more specifically in his death, in his resurrection, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. Two things were distant. Things were not as they should be. Um, The peace and the harmony that God wanted with his creation 
It was not existent at that point. And so there had to be some kind of reconciliation. And the way that God was going to reconcile the world to himself was by the cross, by his son Jesus choosing to lay down his life in redemptive suffering. Not retribution, not, not all the punishment, just the punishment, but to redeem the world. And so there's pain and there's suffering in that life. And there's Jesus having to deal with all that burden and all the struggles that he had. You read about it at the end of his life, the garden where he's, he's pouring out his heart to God. Let this cup pass for me. Let there be another way. But nevertheless, not my will, not what I want, but what you want be done. That's his prayer. And that leads to his choice of redemptive suffering. In all the evil and the pain and suffering in the world at that time, at the end of the life of Jesus, Jesus shows us a better way. In all the evil and the pain and suffering in our lives today, we're not left without a guide or without any kind of way. Jesus still offers us a better way. The way of the cross, in our songbook, the way of the cross leads home. And I like that, and you like that. I think we're all good with that. But it doesn't just lead home. I think what I really want us to get from what we're talking about today, about the cross, we wear it, we talk about it, we celebrate it, we thank God for it. The cross is deeper than that. The cross is about Jesus choosing a life of redemptive suffering, choosing a uh, redemptive sacrifice. And in doing so, he does something for us, and he shows that something should happen to us. And so the, the way of the cross is not just leading home. The way of the cross is really the way of life. And maybe that's a little bit wrong on the screen. Maybe the way of the cross is not the way of life right now, but it's definitely the way that life should be. If that doesn't make any sense right now, that's okay. I think the verses on the screen will explain it. If you came into here today and you just thought the cross is a transactional thing that Jesus did, he went to the cross so I can go to heaven and have my sins washed away and be forgiven and have salvation and redemption, that's okay. That's part of it. It's not all of it. That's not at all how many of the writers in the New Testament talk about the cross. For instance, if you've got your Bibles, I'd love for you to go over and find Ephesians chapter 5 for just a minute. This is one of the clearest places where anybody writes about this and says the cross is a little bit more than just being forgiven. It's not about, it is, but it's not just about eternal life. It's also about this life. And so Paul says, In Ephesians 5, verse 1, be imitators of God. Actually, chapter 5, verse 1 is the first verse in chapter 5, but you probably know this. When Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, he didn't put chapter breaks and verse distinctions. There were none of that. It was a letter that he wrote, and he sent it. And so the thing that he said right before this is what we call Ephesians 4, verse 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And so we got that redemptive suffering kind of idea already. And then he jumps right into, there's no chapter break in the originals, all right? God in Christ forgave you, and so therefore, be imitators of God. What's he saying, you think? You think he's saying that what you see in Jesus, maybe that should influence how you live your life? I think that's what he's saying. And how you see Jesus treat people and respond to people, that's how you ought to treat people and respond to people? You think that's what he's saying? Because I think it is. Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Well, that's easy. God is love. We know love by God. We love God. We love our neighbors as ourselves. We know all the love passages, right? That's good. Walk in love. And then it gets difficult. As Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. You see, The love feels good, but then he starts talking about this as Christ loved us and gave himself up as a sacrifice, and then it gets dirty. He's saying, look at what Jesus has done. Not just Jesus, particularly in focus at the end of Ephesians 4, the first part of Ephesians 5, is look at the cross of Jesus. And look at what Jesus did on the cross. And then go live like that. Is he saying that I should go and give my life for the redemption of the world. No, I don't have that power. not that kind of person. He is saying, look at the cross and the choice that Jesus makes to lay down his life for the good of somebody else and go live like that and go do that. 
If that means that somebody wrongs you and you forgive them as God as, as for Christ Jesus, then go forgive that person. Be imitators of God. Live in love as you see love displayed on the cross. That's what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 5. It's not just Paul. He's not even the first one who said it. Because Mark chapter 8, and if, if by the way, Mark 8 and 9 look familiar to you, it's because we've already used those same chapters where Jesus said, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to be delivered over, they're going to kill me, I'm going to rise. And everybody said, I don't understand what this guy's talking about. Well, in the middle of those contexts, Mark 8, verse 31 is, I'm going to the cross. Verse 34 begins this discussion of, now you, if you're going to come after me, you need to deny yourself and take up your cross, and then you can follow me. What do you mean, Jesus? Deny myself and take up my cross. Because at that point, the cross is not a necklace. It's not what we wear on our shirts. It's not what Miss Joe has hanging on her office. It's not what I got in my office. It's not something we think about. It's not something that we thank God for. It's something we try to avoid. It's something that we would never want to happen to us because that's what happens to criminals and thieves. It's what happens to insurrectionists. It's what happens to people who blaspheme God. That's who goes to the cross. And so why in the world would Jesus say, now I'm going to the cross, and they say, I don't understand what this is talking about, and I'm scared to ask at this point. And by the way, Jesus follows that up with, it's not just me. You need to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. What in the world is he talking about? He continues, those who want to save their lives will lose them, but if you will lose your life, then you'll find it. And it seems that what he's talking about there is a life of self-denial for the good of others. You take up your cross, you deny yourself, and you follow Jesus. You imitate God in love as you see God displayed in Jesus on the cross. And that means you're willing to selflessly give up things in your life for the good of other people. That's redemptive sacrifice. It's not a cross. It's not me going to the cross to spill my blood for everybody. It is me living my life in the pattern of the cross. It's also what we find in Mark chapter 9. Same context, basically. Jesus is talking about the cross, and he says, you know, the cross is going to lead you to do some things differently in your life. It's not just something we thank God for, that your body was on the tree and it took our sins and your blood was shed that covers our sins. We do thank God for that. Don't minimize that. It's a huge part of the cross. It's not the only part of the cross. Jesus talks about the cross. It's not just something that is transactional. It's not just something that I'm forgiven and I'm healed and I'm good to go. It's not just transactional. It should be transformational. The early writers began to talk about a cross-shaped kind of life, a cruciform, that's the word, life, cross-shaped life. Not that I go and and I'm hanging on a tree at the end of life, but that the way I deal with people is cross-shaped, sacrificial. The way that I respond to people is cross-shaped. The words that I speak have a crossed shape. The things that I do, the characters in my life, the behaviors in my life, they all should have some shape of the cross. A sacrificial life of humility and sacrifice, the opposite of pride, decrease, love for our neighbors, love for our enemies. The way of the cross doesn't just lead home. The way of the cross is the way that life should be. And so Jesus Again, in Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Remember verse 31, he said, by the way, I'm going to the cross. Well, can't believe that. Don't really understand it. Not sure what in the world you're talking about. And at this point, I'm afraid to ask. Verse 32, verse 35. Basically, Jesus says, this is what it means for you. The first must be last and become servant of all. Now, about that word servant, we've cleaned it up a little bit. It's the word slave. It's not the word servant. They would have understood it as slave. We serve a gospel. That's the life of a cross-shaped Jesus follower. In Mark chapter 10, verse 14, these aren't on your screen right now, but they are all in the same context. Jesus is talking about, I'm going to the cross. I'm going to give my life up for the redemption of many, and that means something about your life. What does it mean about our life, Jesus? Well, in Mark 10, um, verse 14, there are some people who want to bring their babies to Jesus. And some want to forbid them from coming to Jesus because they think he's too important. He ain't got time for that. But Jesus says, you know, let the children come to me. 
A little bit later in the same chapter, verse 21, rich young ruler has come to Jesus. Lord, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Surely you're going to tell me about the cross, right? Keep the commandments. Good, I've done those since I was a youth. Little boy, I've been keeping all of those commandments. Hadn't been murdering, committing adultery, been observing the Sabbath. I hadn't been treating people wrong. I'm not a liar. I'm not a thief. I don't, I don't do all the bad stuff in the commandments. That's great. Jesus says, one thing you lack. And he says, verse 21, go and sell all that you've got, give it to the poor, and then you can come follow after me. Be generous. One thing you lack. Generously give away your stuff to the poor. What in the world does the cross have to do with that? Everything. Because the, the cross, and what I mean by that is a selfless, sacrificial approach to life. The way of the cross is the way of life. I think it's what Jesus means when he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. This is the way. This is the way. It's the way of the cross. It's what Paul picks up on if you got your Bibles over in Philippians chapter 2. These are real world examples for Paul. They got some problems, man, they got some issues in this church in Philippi, and Paul writes them a letter. And he says in verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Why not? Why wouldn't I? I mean, that benefits me. You do it. It benefits you. Why wouldn't I do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves? When the last time you did that? Who lives that way? Who does this? We're much better as consumers a little bit worse as servants. But that's what Paul's calling us to be here, right? To model what we see on the cross. The way of the cross is the way of life. Nothing from selfish ambition or conceit count others more significant than yourselves. That takes work. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you're just way better than me, but are we really sitting around thinking about, and he is so much better. He is so much more important. She is so much more valuable. Are we doing that? Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What do you mean? I've got to think about other people. And this is, this is real world stuff for Paul. This is made up. This is not just him in the abstract talking about the cross or anything like that or what a life of Christianity is. This is Paul saying, hey, you got problems in life? Have you considered maybe it's you? You can't get along with people in life? Have you considered maybe it's you? You have trouble in your relationships, you have trouble in your marriage, you have trouble with the kids, you have trouble with the parents, you have trouble in this area at work, you have trouble at school. Have you considered, maybe, maybe it's you? Don't do anything out of selfish ambition or conceit. Be humble, count others more significant than yourselves. Look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of other people. Who does that? Who lives that kind of life? Why would that be the kind of life that Paul tells us to live? Because that's the way of the cross. Don't believe me? I don't blame you. Listen to him. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped. Let's break that down for a second. All right. In the form of God, equality with God, did not count that state or status as something to be grasped. I don't know how to say the original word, so I'm not going to try it, but it's the idea of holding on to for dear life. That's Paul. Jesus, equal with God, form of God, did not count that status as something to hold on to for dear life and never let go. Could he have done that? Sure. He's God. Did he have the power to do that? Of course he did. He's God. But he chose to lay down his life for others. Not taken away from him. It's not that the powers were more powerful than Jesus. It's that he chose to lay down his life for others. It's that he chose not to do anything from selfish ambition or conceit, but considered those around him as more important than him and did not consider his own interest, but also the interests of others. And so Jesus can be in the form of God, equal with God, and not hold it as something to be grasped or held on to for dear life. Well, what do you do instead? Well, he emptied himself, verse 7, by taking the form of a servant, slave, being born in the likeness of men and being found 
in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You want real world example of what we're talking about, about the way of the cross is the way of life? There it is. It means we don't do selfish stuff. It means that we don't think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. It means that we find the roots of pride in our life and we uproot those roots. It means that we take the jealousy and the envy and the lust and the greed and the, the anger that we harbor sometimes and we say, you know what? None of it's worth it. That's not the way of the cross. That's the way to death. Those are the works of the flesh. The way of the cross is the love and the joy and the peace and the kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness, loyalty, um, self-control. Those are the way of the cross. That's the way of the cross. That's the way of life. It's not just in the abstract. These are real world things. First must be last and become servant of all. Become as little children. Let the little children come to me. One thing you lack, he tells the rich young ruler, go give generously everything you've got, then come follow after me. Why would I do that? Who lives that way? The followers of Jesus do. Who acts like that? People who want to follow Jesus. What would motivate me and you to do some of that crazy stuff in our lives? Paul said we are fools for Christ because we're trying to model what we see on the cross. And so, my friends, that's what the cross is. Sure, don't want to minimize the redemptive sacrifice made on the cross, but I don't want to leave it there. And I don't want to leave it there because Paul didn't leave it there and Jesus didn't leave it there. None of them did. They recognized that the church, Christians like us, we are supposed to be the visible compassion of God on earth. Whenever they look at our lives, they ought to see the love of God. When they see how you treat people tomorrow, they ought to see the love of God. When they hear how you talk about people and how you talk to people, they ought to see the visible love and compassion God on the earth. When they see how you give generously to the needy, they ought to see the visible love of God on the earth. When they see how you love the least lovely people in your life, they ought to see what God is like, his love on earth. When they see you sacrifice your selfish interest for the good of somebody else, then they ought to see a visible, uh, visible representation of God's love on the earth. That's what it's about. That's the way of the cross. It leads home, but it leads to a different way of life. In the cross, Jesus did not come to change God's mind about us. It was already made up. We are what we are. God creates us. God knows us. God knows who we are. He knows our flaws and our faults. In the cross, Jesus came to change maybe our minds about God, about what God is like about what love looks like, about what is really good, what, what is a good way of living, it's the way of the cross. About what's an evil way of living, it's being an enemy of the cross in Paul's language. That's the selfish, hateful kind of life. The cross then, it can be viewed as a free gift that ensures an eternal home for us. And I gotta tell you, I think in, in 2024, that's the most common view of the cross but I hope it's not your view. I hope you don't view the cross just as a free gift that ensures an eternal home for you. Instead, I hope you see the cross as a beautiful picture of God's goodness and love. I hope you see the cross as truth, a true picture that instructs us, teaches us about how we should live. And so this morning, when you look at that cross, what do you see? You see a free gift that allows you to, to be forgiven for your sins, but you're still as selfish as you were. You still do the same stuff that you've always done. Nothing's really changed. Just a free gift that covers me. Or do you see it as something beautiful? Do you see it as the way that you should live your life? Do you see it as a beautiful picture of sacrifice and of love and compassion for other people? Do you see it the way that Jesus viewed it and the way that Paul wrote about it and how the early Christians thought about the cross? When you look at the cross, what do you see? Something beautiful, something free. 
something to live out, a transformational kind of life, or a simple transaction that ensures heaven. I hope it's something beautiful. That's the beauty that will save the world. That's the true beauty that Jesus has come into the world to save. That's the John 3.16. For God so loved you and us and the whole world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have the eternal life. And you can begin to live that kind of eternal life now by living a cross-shaped life, by being the visible picture of God's compassion, love, and grace, and mercy, and justice in the world today. That's how Jesus viewed it. It's how Paul wrote about it. I don't, know how we, I don't know how we come away from reading Paul's words in Philippians 2 with any other idea than the cross should influence how you and I live our lives today. And so today, what may need to change for you? You could be here today and have never uh, decided that you're going to follow Jesus in this way of the cross, the way and the truth and the life. You've never decided that that's, that's going to be you. And so maybe today you're ready to begin that journey of following Jesus, and you've, you've got faith in him, you're ready to trust him, you're ready to, to live life, and that's what I mean by trust. You're ready to live life in the way that he wants us to live life. And so you're ready to turn away from what Paul labels as selfish ambitions and pride, and you're ready to turn towards a life that is seeking the goodness of God in the lives of people around you and your life. You're ready to, that's what the Bible calls repentance, turn away from self, turn toward selflessness, and so maybe you're ready to do that. You're ready to be baptized into Christ. You're ready to begin this journey in, in following Jesus in everything you say and everything you do and all the actions of your life, how you act at school, how you act at work, what you talk about, how you talk about people. You're ready to follow Jesus and all that. Maybe you're ready to begin that today in baptism. Maybe you've done that. But the way of the cross has not really led to a different way of living for you, and maybe today that's what needs to change. And maybe there are parts of your life, I don't know them, you probably know them, parts of your life that need to be more cross-shaped, that look more like the attitude and the mindset that Jesus has while he goes to the cross for the good of people around him. And so maybe there are changes you ought to make in your life when it comes to that. Maybe there are some things that you want us to be praying about for you. Um, we have Jesus who lives to make intercession for us today. And so if there are prayer things that are on your heart, and we want to be praying about those things to lift you up. So whatever your need is today. If the cross means anything to you more than just being a free gift, it means something beautiful should be showing up in your life, something good, something truthful, something that, that blesses the people around you, then why wait to get that started? Why not make the change that needs to be 